Survivorship Echo Series. Um, we are very excited to have you with us tonight. Um, since many of you, this is probably a new experience, we'll go over um, a few things, but we're going to be pretty rapid fire here. And luckily, I think we've got our caffeine and our coffee, so we are ready to go. Um, but the good part about tonight's content is we're going to be talking about cardio oncology. So hopefully, this will be um, a topic where not only will the ECHO cover some basic didactic and, and give you some background, but we're also going to talk tonight um, about some cases where we can really apply that didactic and figure out how we um, take some of the things that we talk about tonight and hopefully use them in clinic tomorrow, next week, and, and going forward. So what we're going to do to start with is just give you guys a little bit of background on what ECHO is and how this works. So tonight we have um, a group of experts with us. Um, I know many of you on, on the air. Um, I'm Jennifer Klimp. I'm our Director of Cancer Survivorship at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Um, these are partners, the Sonic Cancer Alliance, University of Kansas Cancer Center, and this is a um, uh, Project ECHO, which will give you a little bit of background if you're not familiar. And to my right is my colleague, esteemed colleague, Dr. Anne O'Day. Please introduce yourself. Hi all, I'm Anne O'Day and I'm a breast oncologist here at the University of Kansas Cancer Center and I'm the Medical Director for Breast Cancer Survivorship. Great. And Elaine. Hi, my name is Elaine Knipper. I am a new nurse navigator with our cardio-oncology and cardiac amyloid program. So I assist uh, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Porter in getting these referrals in um, and kind of increasing our access to care. Great. And then I also have two other folks, which are a little hard to see because we kind of zoom the camera in, but I have Trish Long. Trish, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, Trish Long from Masonic Cancer Institute. And Trish is a PA and mm -hmm. works with us on our Rural Cancer Survivorship Project. And Kendra. And hi, my name is Kendra. I'm a Clinical Research Coordinator with the KU Cancer Center. Great. So that's our team here. And this is our agenda for tonight. So we're going to do some introductions, give you a quick kind of review of housekeeping for Project ECHO, and then we're just going to dive right in. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, we're going to give you ways that we want you to interact with us and really talk about how we want to build this as a community of practice. Um, just to give you kind of a heads up, we do provide continuing education for both physicians and nurses. Um, you will get uh, a survey at the end if you um, have registered. So if you do want your continuing education credits, you're actually going to, would you, let's stop that. Can, uh, Kendra's going to stop that real quick, sorry. Doesn't it always want to install when we're like on a WebEx? So sorry about that. Um, we will give you on the next slide um, how you get your continuing education credits. Here's our uh, disclosures. Um, you can see that uh, not only um, do we have our financial relationships, which you will get a copy of if you would like them, um, but most of our team have no disclosures except I think Dr. O'Day and I. So um, otherwise, we um, have listed all of our disclosures for you on this slide. And here's how you get your credit. So you have three ways. You can text in the, the number 85 Hope. I'm not sure how they come up with those, but 85 H O L P. Text it. You can email it in um, using um, uh, the website and you log into an EADS account, or you can download the mobile app. And if you're going to be participating in more of the series, it's worth going ahead and kind of logging in and getting your um, account set up so that way you can, you can have easy access to that going forward. And we will go ahead and give you that code at the end just so that you remember um, how to get your credit uh, at the end of this project echo. So who is helping us to support this? We have a great partner through our Kansas Department of Health and Environment and the CDC, and through a survivorship grant that we have, we're able to facilitate um, quite a few survivorship services throughout the state, including the Survivorship Echo Series. So thank you to our partners. So a check-in, and as you can see, this is a busy slide. And so we're going to take the feedback from some of our prior echoes, which many of our users um, are very tech savvy. So you'll see in your chat box, one way that we do encourage check-in is to go ahead and just put your organization and your names, because there's several of you at some of the organizations um, on the list. Um, and so go ahead and, and you can check in there. So why do we do a check-in and how does a check-in work? 
Well, part of the reason we do a check-in is because Project ECHO is meant to build a community of practice. And what that really means for us is that throughout the region and hopefully kind of throughout the country, we're building partnerships and relationships to care for our patients with evidence-based care and being able to pick up the phone, text someone, and have those colleagues um, that can help us co-manage our patients. So the important part is that we all need to meet each other. And how do we do that? Well, the first way we're gonna do that is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick like, and we're gonna go through and just sort of see everybody who's potentially on our Echo, and hopefully it'll pop up. Do, there, do you see lots of, um, how do I share this? Can I share this? Oh, hold on, I'm figuring this out. Sorry, you guys. It's going too fast here. Do I double click that? But how do I do that? Sorry, you guys, I'll get this one second. Because when I had it off and stopped sharing, then I could see them all. There you go. But they can't see them. No. I can't put it on that. Thank you. There we go. There you all are. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, um, so some of you have already checked in on the chat box. Some of you haven't. And if we could just kind of quickly go through, what we would like to do is just acknowledge um, the organizations and, and have you guys sort of um, say hi. And if there's anything you want to say about survivorship and why you're here, uh, we definitely want to hear from you. So we will go through kind of an order. And Carrie, do you want to go ahead and say hi? There we go. Hi, this is Carrie. Good. I'm a navigator from Alifa Health. Great. Hi, Carrie. All right. Um, Sue, Sue Condon. We're just going to call people out. Hi, I'm Sue Condon. I'm the rehab director at North Kansas City Hospital. Great. Nice to have you. Thanks. Jan Lyon. Hi, I'm Jan Lyon. I'm with KU Med Center's Project Echo. Great. Good to have you, Jan. Dr. Greiner. Hi, Alan Greiner. I'm with the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Medical Center. All right. Thank you for joining us tonight. Carla. Hi, I'm Carla. Carla Ostranek, I'm the physician assistant with Olathe Cancer Care. Great, nice to have you. Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin Mossart. I'm the breast health nurse navigator from Hayes Med Breast Care Center. Great, Anita, oh, sorry about that. We keep going to, keep wanting to update. Anita, there you go. Oh, and we can't hear you. You may still be muted, even though it doesn't say you are. All right, we'll come back to you, or you can put your name in the chat box. Tracy McCarty. And tell them who you are, Tracy. Well, I'm trying to show my face, but it's not letting me get there. Um, I am, sorry, I'm Tracy McCarty. I am the Education Program Manager for the Midwest Cancer Alliance, and you'll probably be receiving a lot of communication from me. And we welcome all of you and glad that you're on today. Great. So Tracy is the person where you're going to get emails from, and we really want you to be able to reach out to her if you need anything. Allie. All right. How about Stephanie? Shelby. Hi, this is Stephanie. I'm the social worker at Tammy Walker Cancer Center in Salina. Great. And is there anyone else from Salina on the line? We'll do Salina. We'll Not today. With. All right. Last time, you guys were great with the genetics echoes. Hope to have your team participate. They are going right. to. Yeah. Good, good. All right, Shelby. No. All right. Well, Shelby may come on in a second. Looks like she's unmuted. Mary Beth Warren. Hi, 
Well, Mary Beth is the person who's in charge of you getting your CED. So we are really glad that Mary Beth is joining us and we wanna make sure that you guys um, all fill out your survey and get your credits. All right, Connie. Hi, I'm Connie Wood. I'm the Director of Oncology at Advent Health. Thanks for asking us to join. You bet, thanks for joining us. All right, who else have we not called? If I haven't called you, because some of you have like just LMH Health, um, I know Dr. Barr and Lori, you guys chat, checked in on chat, but we always love to hear from you as well. Lori Winfrey is here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lori Winfrey, Dr. Jody Barr. This hey, is Heather. Jen, this is... Hi. Go ahead. And Jen, this is Carol Bush from uh, the uh, interstate at Emporia. But anyway, I'm with Coleman, but I'm on the phone. Are you on I-70 cruising down the highway? Uh, no, I'm, I'm on the turnpike in the snow. There you go. Well, you drive careful and you get your I will. free. I'm parked. All right. I'm, Carol, I'm not she's driving. With the, she's with the Kansas uh, and uh, Western Missouri Komen affiliate, which is a merged affiliate now. And we're really glad to have her on. All right. Anyone else? Because there's a few 588, 5,000. Jennifer. Jen. Hi. Hi. This is Trisha Layton, Prisma Health. Yes, Trisha from South Carolina. Good to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks. Well, anyone else who hasn't chimed in, please use the chat box. And this takes a little longer the first time. We will go through that because feedback you have given us from the last echoes is that you want to really dive into the cases and we get that, but we do want you to be part of this community. So I think the important part is that we still get to connect with each other um, while we're obviously trying to um, um, really learn, but the connection part is, is important. And you getting to know each other um, and seeing that we're from all over the state and some folks from other parts of the country um, is really uh, great. And thank you all once again for joining us. So we'll pop this back up so you guys can, can see. Once again, we um, have a great representation of, of who's here tonight. All right, let's see if we can, there we go. All right, so you do need to know that we are recording this and the good part is that these will be available to you for future viewing and that's gonna be at the Masonic Cancer Alliance website. I will have that at the end. And one of the great parts about what we're gonna be providing is you'll see a little red toolbox and that toolbox is where we're gonna put some articles, best practices, evidence-based care, and all of that will be on the Masonic Cancer Alliance website. So you're gonna be able to actually find all those resources in one place, you don't have to dig around, um, and we want you to be able to use those resources um, effectively and not have to uh, wonder, well, where'd they get that cool article? We're gonna provide it to you. So some helpful hints. We know many of you are driving like Carol Bush down the turnpike, uh, we do not expect you to obviously show your face while you're driving, but we're super glad that you're participating. We want you to use the audio if at all possible. Um, please unmute yourself to ask a question, or if you have something in the chat box, Trish is manning our chat tonight um, so we can answer those questions real time. We do want people to be muted otherwise because no, we know how funny it is on a conference call when people are like having the sidebar talking about their lunch order. So we just want to be respectful of folks' time. Um, as you know, we all speak very fast, but hopefully we speak clear. And if there's something you can't understand or we um, open that up for questions, we want you to be able to, to hear each other. Uh, so speak clearly, speak very concisely if possible, because we have a lot to cover. And Everybody was really great with a chat feature in the past echoes, so we encourage you to use that again. And as we said, we'd love to see your face, your smiling face. Uh, it is the end of the day, some of you are commuting home, but if you can put that camera on. Um, I've done our echoes from the back of an Uber, from the airport, <laughs> so it doesn't matter where you are, we wanna see you. And we're gonna start by teaching you real quick like to poll. And if you've never polled before on Zoom, it's very easy. If you're driving, do not poll. But if you're not, as this pops up, you're going to see green boxes. And every time you see a green box, that's a polling question. And we'll start by showing you what that looks like. And instantly, we're going to be able to see the responses. So this is going to help us sort of right size 
some some topics like where are you how much do you know about different topics and it will also help us um, to really gauge what additional information is probably necessary so Tracy's going to go ahead and pop up our first polling question so you can see that so anytime you see the bright green box there you go have you ever participated in a previous project echo session yes or no just click the box and hit submit you can click your box oh no you have to use your yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right, and then Tracy will pop up the answers for us. There you go. So about 55% of you have not ever participated in the ECHO. So it's very helpful once again to go through that information, um, but interaction, community of practice is really our goal using this telementoring sort of method um, of delivery. So if you do have any questions or you wonder sort of what this project echo means, um, you know, please do not hesitate to um, to answer to ask that. But maybe that's me. Is that me? We're better now. I want to know how to get rid of that. Uh oh. We are, I think, are you still sharing? Yeah, but I'm not sharing the screen. Here we there we go. Okay, great. So to kick off, why are we doing this comprehensive approach to cancer survivorship? We know that cancer survivorship is multidisciplinary. It requires a team approach as we really try to care for our patients from the time of diagnosis through the lifespan. So we really embrace that definition of having a extended um, relationship with our patients. Um, and as we'll see tonight, some of those patients have pretty in-depth needs, both from the time they're diagnosed, really through their entire lifespan. So I think the important part as we think about how these disciplines work together, as we think about how when we started building programs, you know, we really had to sit down with our colleagues in cardiology, with our colleagues in fertility preservation, because you have great experts available to you in your organization, in your community, across the state, but how do we really work in a functional relationship? And I think the hard part is it requires us to know who they are, build those workflows, and part of what we'll talk about tonight with cardio-oncology is an example of how we start to take those steps to really prioritize that multidisciplinary care for our patients with some of the issues that are most important, um, both acutely during treatment and into longer term survivorship. And so this is just a quick summary of sort of head to toe and really thinking about sort of those late and long term effects. We talk about late effects as those that maybe um, they, their risks from cardiotoxic drugs, maybe a patient uh, gains weight over time, maybe it's a bone health issue. And so we know that some of these effects can happen three months, six months, 12 years down the road. But we also know that some issues will happen during treatment and then they will go ahead and persist into the longer or extended phase of survivorship. So as part of this ECHO series, we're starting with cardio-oncology, kind of that cardiotoxicity. Um, we will talk about psychosocial issues, cancer rehab, and some lifestyle, especially thinking about tobacco and other types of, of exposure. And the most important part, and I think the hardest part, as our patients go through this journey, is which is their greatest clinical challenge. So Dr. O'Day is gonna share with us tonight some of that insight, because as you're thinking about your patient, both acutely and in an extended survivorship environment, we know that maybe those issues will change. The goal is to keep a patient on treatment and we have to work with some of our partners in order to address those effects um, to keep them on their life-saving drug. And when we think about our, your greatest clinical challenge, um, do you use kind of a, um, a risk stratified model to do that? Like, are, how do you think about that, Dr. O'Day? I think for our patients, especially when we're approaching a, a new patient that's diagnosed with early stage disease, of course, we're thinking about their long-term health at that point. So we're looking at what risk factors they come to us, they sort of bring to the table. So whether that's previous chemotherapy, some of them, whether that's pre-existing coronary disease or a strong family history of coronary disease or those types of things. And then for our um, patients that have advanced disease or, or metastatic disease, we know that we're, um, we're gonna have to work as a team in order to be able to keep that patient 
on therapy for really the rest of their life, um, intermixed with treatment breaks and, and things like that. So we really have to stratify from the beginning uh, what this patient sort of brings to the table and then what our goal is moving forward. Um, for some patients, we may be willing to sacrifice something in the short term, especially in terms of quality of life, if it's worth it for sort of a long-term investment. Um, but for our patients with metastatic disease, we know that it really is critical for them to be able to stay on this therapy. And so something that we put very high on their list of priorities for sure. And I think one of the things we'll also see is, is Dr. Day has a very good way of doing that cost benefit with her patient to really figure out what are their goals, what are they sort of willing, um, and what risks are they willing to, to give up? Because you have to have that real shared decision-making bi-directional conversation in order to understand the, the needs of our patients. Um, so the patient has to be part of this process as well. So we start, and Dr. Shaw is uh, one of our cardio-oncologists here at KU, and he's going to be joining us, but he did just text that his last patient showed up. It's, of course, snowing, as we heard from Carol Bush. <laughs> yeah. So he was hoping to be here um, a little earlier, but as soon as he joins, we'll let you know. So we may flip back, but that's the real world that we live in. Right. Um, and uh, we do have two cardio-oncologists here at KU, and as, as Elaine said, uh, Dr. Charles Porter and Dr. Zubair Shaw. Um, and so he'll join us when he's here. Uh, but the great part is that probably over the last decade, there's been this explosion in the field of cardio-oncology. And it's interesting because I do have the benefit of sitting on a task force with the National Cancer Institute and the National Heart and Lung, um, sort of the counterpart for pulmonary and heart um, with the NIH. And by looking at these two organizations, how do we bring together synergy when we both are pretty hyper-focused with, with oncology and cardiology, how do you merge those disciplines? So both from the cardiology world and the oncology world, there's been some position papers that have come out. Now the ASCO paper, which will be in your toolbox, and this is your first example of, of how you'll know what's in the toolbox, is a nice review of sort of the overall you know, aspects of cardiac dysfunction. But the European Society of, of Cardiology, it goes through, here's the drug, Here's what we use for treatment. Here are the tests you use to assess for any late effects, and here's how you manage it. So it really gives you a nice rubric for how you, um, kind of like a recipe for how you assess the late effects. And I think this is becoming more and more important as we have so many new drugs being approved every year. People have combinations of therapy, and how do we really um, manage patients appropriately? And how do you feel about this two paper structure today? So I think the European paper is nice because, as you said, it does give us some very specific. So I'm really lucky that I get to practice with these amazing cardio-oncologists that are really available to me readily. Um, but I have also had the benefit of practicing um, in rural Kansas. And I know that we don't always have people that have an expertise in that that are sort of readily available. So for the navigators, for the nurse clinicians, for um, the medical oncologists, nurse practitioners, advanced practice providers, um, to read that European paper and have that as kind of a reference mm -hmm. um, of things to do um, is, is, I think, very, very helpful. It is. Um, we also want to point out that the American College of Surgeons has recently incorporated um, into their new uh, sort of guidelines or um, standards, if you will, for accreditation, um, that it, how important it is to have um, assessment of cardiotoxicity and a cardio-oncology program as a part of your survivorship care. So they haven't put any specific benchmarks, but they have said it is important to have that type of a program. So something for you guys to think about as whether you want to look at that as um, something you assess when you intake the patients or at the time that they start their uh, chemotherapy or potentially cardiotoxic chemotherapy, but something for you to think about in terms of for your entire system. Absolutely. It's something that we're working towards right now um, at KU trying to develop what's the best way to systematically capture those patients and make sure that they receive the appropriate referral. Right. And that's the new 2020 Commission right. on Cancer Accreditation right. that we're talking about. So we've used sort of cardio-oncology and the building of that program um, as part of our survivorship program. But now we're going to be able to use the outcome of some of the, the intake for new patients and how do we manage those patients going forward, how do we use our, our cardio-oncology navigator and really get those patients at the acute or the screening time point 
into the right level of care. So really providing that risk stratified care, which is really hard to do if we're not doing sort of that systematic approach. Um, the other important thing is that for, in, even with NCCN guidelines, part of the survivorship guidelines do include the assessment of cardiotoxic therapies that were given and really doing an assessment of, of cardiovascular health. And so it's becoming more and more ingrained, whether it's accreditation standards or best practice. Um, so really, these are not going to be options going forward. These are just how we need to be thinking about how we manage our patients from the time they walk in our door through their lifespan. And so there's some things that are more common than not um, when we think about cardiotoxicity. So this is just sort of a list. Once again, this is all from that European um, uh, Heart Journal. That article is, is going to be your, your kind of go-to. Uh, but myocardial dis dysfunction and heart failure are probably the two most common. Would you agree with that, Elaine? Yes. Yes. And when we think about um, heart failure, you know, that sounds pretty serious, though, to the patient. Um, so when you're talking with a patient and sort of navigating them, how are you assessing? Do you have like a, a short assessment that you do, or how do you sort of frame that um, when you're talking about cardio-oncology? We do. I mean, uh, I kind of come at it twofold. I like to get a little bit of um, background just about what resources that they may also need to get into our clinic. Uh, we do have a lot of referrals from uh, outside and how to get them uh, resources to travel, to get everything lined up. And then we want to know a little bit about what their background was before um, their treatment started and then now and specifically some of those changes. That just kind of with our routine heart failure, you know, are you short of breath, uh, stairs, activity, what are your limitations? Uh -huh. And we do have a, that little cheat sheet. I thought it was the next slide, but it's not. So we'll give you kind of that cheat sheet that you use. Because I think that is really important. And it's also important to train patients and set that expectation. So as we're seeing new patients, if we can tell them, these are the things we want you to look for. This is when you call us. Or when they come back to see you, when you see them and you train them, does that work better from, from your medical oncology standpoint? I think especially for those patients that are going to be on long term, so not for the patients receiving short-term therapy, for example, with an anthracycline, but those patients that, for example, have HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, we now have patients going on 10, 11 years of therapy. And so it's very important to empower those women to, um, of what to look out for in terms of signs of both systolic and diastolic heart failure. Um, and one thing just to mention um, that isn't specifically listed on, on this uh, diagram, but as we see this emerging body of evidence about immunotherapies um, for uh, causing myocarditis, for example. So in the past, you know, as breast oncologists and people that use a lot of these um, cardiotoxic agents, um, this is an entirely new field that now the lung cancer specialists and the bladder cancer specialists and all of the people that are accessing immunotherapy, it's going to become increasingly important that we recognize that that is a rare complication of immunotherapy and that those patients are sort of recognized and can have the appropriate referrals because that is an example of heart failure that may be managed completely differently from a normal sort of um, heart failure patient. Right. And with the immunotherapies where, you know, you're, you're having um, such a lot of patients who are on them and you're getting these responses, I think the bigger challenge is that we don't know what we don't know. Correct. And that's where having this, this ability to pay attention is going to be mm -hmm. really important. And this is sort of a list. Um, this isn't every drug that causes, uh, you know, has a cardiotoxic side effect, but the incidents are, of course, ranges. So when you see things that go up to 48%, you know, there's a, a slew of articles um, that go in, especially when we talk about anthracyclines and some of the older drugs, there's a lot of data out there. But also, you have to remember, and this is one of the biggest challenges with cardiovascular data, is that we are talking about data from clinical trials that were very specific with relatively healthy people who are part of those trials. So there's currently registries, and we're getting ready to open one of those registries here in partnership with our colleagues at WashU, where we look at the real life experience of these patients. Because these numbers are strictly from being able to take a SWOG trial or another type of um, investigator initiated trial where we have data sets and they've been pooled. And so you're going to see, you know, differences in incident. But what about that older patient who has four com comorbid conditions to begin with? We don't have any data on that average patient that's in your clinic. 
And I think that's one of the bigger challenges. And would you agree with that, Dr. O'Day? Correct. And I think those are things we have to be aware of in our threshold for recognizing signs of cardiac dysfunction in that patient population has to be much higher. Right. Um, the average, you know, over 70 year old hasn't been included in any of the clinical trials. So they're going to be um, disproportionately underrepresented it underrepresented in this data. And so we know that aging is a risk factor for cardiac disease. And so obviously that's something we need to keep in mind as, as we're looking at our, the patients Absolutely. that we actually see in our clinic, as opposed to the patients we read about in these studies. Right. And when you think about these drugs and you think about the two most vulnerable populations, think about the ends of the continuum. Your youngest and your oldest patients are automatically going to be at higher risk. We're exposing someone who, with a childhood cancer or, an, or a young adult cancer, they have a lot of life ahead of them. So that means we're going to accelerate cardiovascular risk by a decade or more in someone who is diagnosed with cancer at 14 or at 19. And then our older population who the average, because we've actually looked to see how many comorbid conditions do our patients have, and in particular, cardiovascular disease is of course the most common, uh, we know that they have Oh, almost four, it's like 3.7 uh, comorbid conditions. So these are complex patients that, especially when you're thinking about, well, where should I start? Is it every patient? You could start with, you know, the, the, your kind of bookends and then move in, uh, but you have to start somewhere because I, I do think that, you know, this is something that if you keep waiting and we keep putting this off, it's, it's sort of only gonna get um, a little bit more challenging. So I think real quick, we're going to pause right there and go to our team and see, do any of you have any comments or questions, um, either in the chat box or if you want to unmute yourself, in relation to sort of what we've talked about so far, um, the different therapies or the different ways that, that you know, we, we need to incorporate cardio-oncology into our practice. And don't be shy. You guys are, I know a lot of you out there, and very few of you are shy. <laughs> And if you don't have questions, that's okay. But we want to try to get you guys um, interacting a little bit. I'm just curious, are any of the navigators that are out there, um, are any of you guys assessing cardiac risk factors in your initial intake of patients? Is that something that you're looking at or that you provide to the clinicians? Is anybody looking at that? Um, Caitlin from Hayes. Um, I kind of, I don't really assess in particular like a cardiac, I do an overall comorbidities, um, you know, general, you know, your, are you, have you had a heart attack, have you have um, heart failure, but then I also include, you know, like COPD, diabetes and things like that, um, but I don't, you know, go into super detail, just kind of get an overall comorbidities that they currently have. Great. That's great. And Lawrence typed in that they don't routinely do that. Um, yeah, it's something that we kind of have to start, I think it's something we have to start thinking about, you know, system-wide, what's the best and easiest way um, to do that. And, um, and I was I just curious if anybody had that as a part of their standard practice. And I think, as you, you want to just quickly describe, we're trying to incorporate that in for mm -hmm. all new onboards. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this is not an easy task, so we get that. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure all of you were like, yeah, everything new we try to do is hard. But um, what are you, we're thinking less is more? Do you want to give a little bit of? So what we're trying to do is to at least start with the patients that are going to be receiving um, some sort of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy. Um, and all of those patients standardly at our center go through a chemotherapy education pro process with an advanced practice provider. So either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. So what we're trying to do is sort of build in some standard screening at that visit where the patient has a slightly more detailed cardiac history that's obtained. So we find out things about previous uh, cardiotoxic medications they may have received, a detailed family history, uh, details about their other risk factors for coronary disease, such as do they have a history of high cholesterol, uncontrolled hypertension, you know, did their father have or their brother have, you know, an MI under the age of 50, you know, these types of things. So we're trying to make sure that we sort of collect that so that we can capture patients that might be more predisposed to developing the consequences of these cardiotoxic right. therapies. And it's a great systematic approach because we know and we'll show you, you know, especially for early stage disease with good chance of cure, especially for breast and prostate cancer survivors, um, these are going to be 
most likely the cause of their death over their cancer. And so we can't, you know, cure patients of heart disease. Cardiac disease That's is correct. more likely oh, sorry. to be there. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Cardiac disease is actually in, in this, we're going to show you this slide, but this is actually disturbing when we think about, in, in most patients, if you ask them, do you think, what do you think is a, you know, a greater threat to your, to your well-being? Is it your cancer? Or is it the fact that you may succumb to cardiac disease in the future? I guarantee you 99% of them will say they're most worried about their cancer. Right. When in reality, they're much more likely to pass away from cardiac disease That's than they right. are their cancer. Thank you. You're, you got me. Sorry. No, I, we have I just want to make sure that, <laughs> that I'm being accurate. Yes. That's why we work in a team. <laughs> this is the important part of teamwork. Makes it all work. Okay, so just a quick, you know, have your sort of rubric for risk factors, and like Dr. O'Day said, you know, what are those risk factors you want to look at? And the lifestyle factors are huge. We know that smoking, alcohol, obesity, those things are modifiable, whereas a lot of things that happen to them, we can't modify. We can't, I'd love to turn back the clock, but we can't do that. Um, you know, family history, all those types of things. And then we want to give patients life-saving or maintenance therapy to improve their quality and quantity of life. Uh -huh. um, so we have to figure out how to manage the cardiotoxicity. Um, just like Caitlin mentioned, you know, these are those common sort of symptoms. Any others that you would like to, to share that isn't that aren't on the list? Uh, I think a big one that we just kind of routinely ask is uh, stairs or sophnia. Um, and then we do uh, try to tease out Dr. Shaw specifically wants to know a little bit uh, when they're coming in as far as the workup if they have those risk factors because he's starting to want to tease those patients out who maybe have hyperlipidemia, smoker, mm -hmm. or family history, and actually start with the stress that go. So we're not repeating, you know, they come in with a 2D and he said, oh, we really should have done this. So right. we're trying to kind of combine a heart failure and a little bit of a family history um, to help us order the right test faster. So you're trying to really do risk stratified testing to streamline that process. Yes. And and that's yeah. great. That's a, that's a really effective way. To, to think about our patient population, and not just with cardiotoxicity. We need to be thinking about with stratified care um, across the board. And those traditional definitions are, you know, where we see patients who drop under 50% with the um, uh, left ventricular, ventricular ejection fraction, or when they have a decrease. Anything else that you kind of look at, though, Dr. O'Day? So for sure, the decrease of 10% or more is something. So you may have a patient that starts out with an ejection fraction of 65, and they may fall in the middle of their Herceptin treatment or their Captilin treatment, they may fall to 50, which is still technically normal. And so that patient will be allowed to go on and keep receiving potentially cardiotoxic therapy. When in reality, the way those drugs were studied, and if you look at all of the adjuvant, Herceptin, Progetta, Captilin trials, what was classified as an exclusion from those trials was if their ejection fraction fell by more than 10%. So even if it's still normal, even if it's 50, if they started out at 65 and it falls to 50, that is definitely a red flag to us that that patient is developing some toxicity from that therapy. And at the very least, it should be at least held while a more thorough investigation is, is under, undertaken. Yeah, great. And these are kind of some of those examples that are out in the literature. Um, this is an older one, um, just showing, as you can see, the 10-year um, um, CHF rates. And patients who didn't receive any therapy, that's the top blue line, adjuvant anthracycline or all other therapy in order. Um, and as you can see, the ones that receive an anthracycline have the, the um, highest chance of uh, developing a, a cardiotoxic um, uh, you know, unfortunate late effect. And it happens as sort of accumulated over time. So yes, there's that group that, you know, kind of happens in the, the first year to two years, but this is sort of one of those extended risk factors where it accumulates over time. So important that we're not just looking at it in that acute phase or in the first one to two years. It needs to be one of the things we're looking at at their annual survivorship visit, at their regular follow-up. Uh, because this is not something that's just a one-time assessment or we check it then again kind of at the end of adjuvant therapy. This is a separate example of looking at the comparison of women with and without breast cancer. And I think this is pretty, pretty you know, shocking when you look at, um, especially five to 10 years out, the slide on the right shows that that, that cumulative incidence um, of mortality um, from cardiovascular disease and it really starts to jump up after that 10-year period where the lines start to split. 
So you're seeing sort of an overlap, and then now we're seeing the Kaplan-Meier start to, to, to deviate and go to opposite directions. And those with a treatment uh, history of breast cancer definitely are on the, on the rise. Um, anything else you guys would like to, to say about that? No, I think, I think that's just something, though, that we think about how hard we work to try to cure these people, especially these women that have a curable cancer, right? We put so much thought and effort into every detail surrounding their therapy, when in reality, um, we might have more impact if we do things like check their cholesterol and um, keep a close eye on their echocardiograms and maybe qualify them for a stress echocardiogram or something like that. So just, so just to kind of, it's good for me as a medical oncologist, as a breast oncologist especially, I get so sometimes laser focused on that that to see a slide like this and remind myself like in the big picture I really need to make sure I'm helping this patient quit smoking or right. I really need to make sure I'm helping them lose weight um, and right. those things are, are incredibly important. Well and I also think that that's really where our primary care come in as well. Um, when we think about how we use care plans or treatment summaries or anything where we are identifying that the patient's had a cardiotoxic drug you know we need to be able to give those those um, handoffs also to our primary care partners so that they're part of that process. Because um, a lot of cancer centers, you know, 10 years out, don't really want to be doing primary care in their oncology clinic. And that makes sense. But somebody and also we're to, not good at it. The primary care doctors are, are far better sure. and they far more abreast of those gui most recent guidelines about blood pressure and cholesterol than, than I am. Right. Um, and so we really have to have that bi-directional conversation so that primary care feels comfortable and that we're not stepping on each other's toes because I don't think any oncologist minds um, if the primary care does all of that. Do you, do you mind? Of course not. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're not going to talk too much about diagnostic tools because uh, Dr. Shaw isn't isn't with us yet. But just know there's a handful of tools out there. Um, we are getting ready also to start a trial using um, some cardiac MRI. So it's a it's a trial um, that will be available to um, cancer patients um, across the state. So we want to welcome your patients to come and participate in that trial. Um, and it will also have a few controls that I think some of us are excited about. So once that trial is available, we'll go ahead and um, shoot that out through the MCA and we'll put it in our toolkit so you can see the trials. Um, we'll, we have one open right now, which Dr. Day will talk a little bit about, um, but we have several others getting ready to open that are specifically looking at cardiotoxicity. And then the cool parts about some of the biomarkers, you know, how do we use troponin and BMP? And, you know, there's there's some literature kind of highlighting how we use it, uh, but we're still trying to kind of figure that out. Would you agree with that, Elaine? I would. I mean, what I've, from what I've seen, and I'm fairly new to it, this role, I came from our advanced heart failure clinic, but is that it really is patient dependent. Um, and I think there's, at least with some of this, a little bit of um, provider, the art of medicine deciding when to do this and not, we're not just throwing in a troponin on everyone. Mm -hmm. but. Yes, there's a lot of art of science, not just uh, science of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. All right. So we're going to jump into our cases um, so that we can get to some of the good stuff. And then you'll have access to ask any questions. And I know I've gone over by like three minutes, and I hate doing that. I try to be so specific on this. Um, once again, your, your code for um, your CE is 85HOLP. Please feel free to, um, uh, to do that so you can get your credit. Uh, you can connect with Elaine at www.cardiooncology at kumc.edu, and you can get all of your resources in the toolbox. Um, so please uh, do not hesitate to reach out to the toolbox. So let's open it up. Any last questions? Thank you for sticking around. In the future, I will be very prompt at getting us out of here right on time. Because I don't like to keep you guys. But questions, comments, and I think somebody did something in the chat box. Trish, did you see anything in the somebody uh, had chat box stuff? Just checking in. Stephanie, okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, any other questions or comments before we, we wrap up tonight? So I think the, the really important piece is that I took away from what Dr. O'Day said. You know, we have to think about these patients and their goals and where they are and the comorbid conditions they come in with. So as you're thinking about these patients, think about those touch points, whether, as Elaine pointed out, is this from navigation and we pull, pull that data right when the patient you know, calls us on the phone. Are we doing some basic intake? As we educate them on chemo, the chemotherapy or their treatment plan, when they come back, 
How often are we doing things? Do we build them as an order set? And I do think that some of the EMR optimization will really help you because if you think about these as order sets and we're putting in survivorship order sets, it's really going to help us not only have flags and should remember to do some of these things, but it's going to make that part of the circle of care for the patient. And in, if you, many of you, which I know you are, Epic users, you can actually now link referrals directly into your order sets. Um, so these are options that we're working on, and we will gladly um, uh, support you in your journey to do this as well. So any other questions, comments before we wrap it up tonight? Next month, second Wednesday of the month, which is what date, Trish? Sorry, Trish, I'll put you on the spot. You we are talking about psychosocial oncology. We're so 11, going to have March 11th. March 11th. Um, going into March Madness, we're going to talk about psychosocial. Maybe you're going to be stressed out because your team doesn't make it to the final four. <laughs> but wow. you can join us, and we will talk about with social work and with psychology, um, how we kind of manage our patients across the continuum and have a great discussion around psychosocial function in our cancer patients. Um, so, any last-minute comments, questions, anyone? You guys are awfully quiet. I'm going to get you guys <laughs> talking, and I'm going to get a few of you to present cases. So, we let you off the hook this time. We presented cases. But next time and going forward, we're going to call on you guys. So, I'll be reaching out and working on cases with you guys uh, because I know you have a lot of questions and comments because I hear from you. Uh, so, we'll make sure that you get involved in, in the case presentation going forward. So thank you all and um, have a great night and we'll see you next month.